well, I will make most of our time here and go ahead and get started. I don't see anyone else in the waiting room quite yet. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us. I'm excited for this public service perspectives um, presentation from one of our very own MPA alums today. Um, for those that don't know me, I am Mackenzie Parsky. I am the special projects coordinator here at the Point of Edge School. Um, before we turn it over to our speaker, just want to cover some quick housekeeping items. Um, just ask you all to stay muted throughout um, to avoid disruptions, but you know, drop drop questions into the chat or any thoughts, ideas you want to contribute into the chat throughout the presentation. Um, at the very end, you are welcome to unmute yourself to ask questions during our Q&A section of the um, program today, or you can continue to drop questions in the chat and um, Jason and I will help address those. Um, last thing to know is we are going to record this session um, and it will be added to our video library in the coming weeks. Um, at this point, I think Jason, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you to introduce our speaker. All right. So Mackenzie, I did notice that downstairs is unmuted because I chatted with you. So uh, just as an FYI. Um, so my name is Jason Jolly and I'm a faculty member here at the Bournemouth School. And I also direct the NPA program. Um, excited to see uh, a good crowd of folks, including a number of our faculty, as well as some alums uh, on the call. Uh, so good to see Kenneth Wilson, who's one of our alums uh, from Franklin County and some others and see some students as well. So really excited uh, to have Demika Withers with us. Uh, Demika is a graduate of our executive MPA program. And we have engaged Demika in a variety of ways uh, here to support the program. So she's spoken to some of our students previously. So uh, she's probably a familiar face to some of our on-campus students. Uh, she's also helping us with some of our recruitment efforts. Uh, but Demika is uh, currently the Chief Economic Equity and Inclusion Officer with the Franklin County Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And uh, we wanted her to come today and talk and share her perspective on uh, public service as part of our public service perspectives uh, series. And so, Demika, I don't want to take any more of, of your time. I want to make sure we have plenty of time for you and plenty of time for questions. But we really appreciate you continuing to give back to the MPA program and to the Boynton School and very appreciative of your time here uh, this morning, uh, or I guess this afternoon, uh, and all of the other things that you continue to do to help us and help our program. So I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Jolly, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for having me. I am excited about another opportunity to speak to uh, the students at Ohio University and alum and all those that are on the call definitely is an act of service, which I, I appreciate. And so I'm going to share my screen and my presentation here with us today. Before we get started, I just want to briefly go over our agenda today and what we are going to discuss. Um, as Dr. Jolly mentioned, I am now in the role serving as the Chief Economic Equity Administrator, and our, our office is charged with focusing on infusing diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts externally and internally on our organization. So I really wanted to just set the stage of kind of the lens in which I am coming from, from my current position through my public service career and really provide some definitions as we move forward with the work walking you through uh, this presentation. So again, setting that framework and then provide some tangible examples of how equity has played out in my career and currently in the work that we are doing here in Franklin County. So a little bit about myself and through my lens, we often, you know, hear about the words of or phrase of showing up as your authentic self and who are you and um, all of the life experiences that you have gained um, throughout your life. So here's a little bit about um, who I am, some formal education. And my undergrad was in, at Kent State University. And as Dr. Jolly stated, an alum of the MPA program. I have spent 22 years in county government working for four Ohio County um, government agencies. I've always worked for county government. Um, I've worked for Mahoney County. I'm originally born and raised from Youngstown, Ohio. I've uh, worked for Cuyahoga County, uh, Geauga County, which is a very small rural um, county in Charlton, Ohio. And I've, I've worked um, currently now at Franklin County. I also spent three years at community-based correctional facility um, helping 18 to 16 year old males reintegrate 
back into society and they were at the facility in lieu of serving um, the sentence for their crime and being able to um, use some rehabilitation efforts through the way you think has a direct effect on how you behave. I really enjoy my time um, teaching peer help groups, um, anger management, social decision making, and um, being able to help individuals connect back to their families and, and to their communities. I love service. That's what I'm about. I wear many, many hats um, in, my, in my life, and I absolutely love it. I have a very close knit and large family. So I'm also called a mom to two children, an auntie of a daughter, a sister, and a friend, um, and a collaborative colleague. I am um, very involved in my church and in my, in my faith, which extends to my neighbors and my friends in my community. Some of my interests, I only put two here. Um, I am a contributing writer and have been doing so since 2018 to a Bible uh, study book by a large uh, Christian company. And that Bible study is geared toward urban communities. So I have been a contributing writer, um, writing articles and devotionals for that Bible study for some time. And I'm all about wellness and fitness and how that impacts um, your life and why that is important. Definitely a component of um, making sure that we are taking care of our mental health as well as we are taking care of our physical and financial well-being. Um, and so those are just some of, of kind of who I'm coming to you as today other than what, what you see. And before we get started, I wanted to go over some key terms and definitions. And so when you look at the word diversity and see that these are some terms that we have heard um, in our society for a few years now um, and how they have sometimes become like the buzzword of what diversity, equity, and inclusion is. How does that play out? You see a lot of public and private corporations hire DEI specialists, DEI executives, and leaders and a lot of times we don't know really what's happening and what does it all mean and did this become important today and so I really want to set the stage to, to not only just through my lens and how I'm showing up but also giving you the definitions in which we utilize to go forward in our work. When you look at the diversity iceberg model um, what you see is up top you can, when you think about an iceberg you see that large structure on top and you think about diversity in that way um, you can make assumptions or biases based off your own experience by someone's physical appearance do they have a physical disability guess an age or a generation that they may be from from what you see so i just explained to you about through my lens that under the iceberg um, who i am as a family member who I am to my, my community, um, who I am to the, the people around me um, as, as a co-worker. And those are the things that, along with my life experiences, that make up who I am. And that's the lens of diversity and what we are, are looking, looking in. It's not just about race and gender, gender and what you see, but it's also what's underneath that iceberg, those invisible differences that um, make up our communities and the people around us. When we think about equity, we want to focus on the guarantee of fair treatment, access and opportunity and advancement, while at the same time striving to identify and eliminate barriers that have prevented the full participation of some groups. The principle of equity acknowledges that there are historically underserved and underrepresented populations and that fairness regarding these unbalanced conditions is needed to assist equality in the provision of effective opportunities to all groups. And what I just read to you was a definition of equity. What does it all mean? I like this illustration. A lot of times we talk about the difference between equality and equity. Equality is going to give the same things to the same individuals, not taken into account for what I may need um, as a black female, as a woman in, in a public service sector. Um, that's when we wanna talk about equity. While we want everyone to be treated the same, we know that in our society and our world and our systems and policies, that that is not true. So when you're looking at this um, illustration, 
of the illustration that's going to um, provide what equity, equality, justice, and, and, and inequality look like. When we're thinking about equity, we want to ensure that we are serving our community and those who are underrepresented who may have a disadvantage because of their um, socioeconomic status, their race, their gender, um, their zip code. And that's when we want to be able to say, we're taking those things into account to advance equity. And inclusion, the, the definition of inclusion is the act of creating environments in which any individual or group can be and feel welcome, respected, supported, and valued to fully participate and bring their full authentic selves to work. And an inclusive and welcome climate embraces differences, offers respect in the words, actions, and thoughts of all people. We cannot talk about equity and diversity without talking about inclusion. Um, we say it a lot here, showing up, like, like I mentioned earlier, as your authentic self, we want to hear the voices of the folks that are around us. So if I'm going to process things and put programs and policies in place um, in, an equitable, my, in an equitable framework, I also have to make sure I'm listening to the words of those who have other experiences who are also affected to ensure that they are also included in what those um, policies and practices and programs are. And that's how we're practicing inclusion, where folks are feeling as if they are they are safe, they feel welcome, they belong, and they can see their self. I feel um, inclusion is practiced in our workplace. I definitely feel welcome and belong. Um, I haven't felt all like that in my career, but in my current in like what I'm currently doing. Being here at Franklin County, I have always seen a representation of myself. I have always um, been valued for my voice and my opinion and then included in, in my life experiences. A little background as well as now that our, we set the definition on the lens of how we are approaching diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, not only in my life, but in the work that I'm doing here at Franklin County. I also want to set the stage for framework before I start talking about the equitable actions in public service and what are some keys to incorporating equity. I wanna also discuss with you kind of where, where we have been and where we are going. I work for Franklin County Board of Commissioners. It is a three board commission. Our um, President O'Grady, um, Commissioner John O'Grady is currently serving as our president. Um, we have a, a county administrator, Kenneth Wilson, who is on this call, who is my boss, who is a great um, county leader, um, who leads our um, one of the largest county in, corporate, in conjunction with our commissioners in the nation. The Board of Commissioners sets the strategic direction and physical priorities for the 30th largest county in the nation, managing an annual budget of $1.5 billion and awarded the highest rate bond um, rating for making fiscally responsible decisions. The Board of Commissioners is the budget and appropriate authority for county government, which includes all county agencies and elected officials. Internally in our Board of Commissioner agencies, we have 14 county agencies that make up our organization, ranging from our health and human services agencies, our community partnerships, um, our public facilities management, public affairs, you see that here on the screen, but also outside of our uh, 14 county agencies, we have 33 um, Franklin County agencies, 42 independent, independently elected officials, and 39 appointed boards, commissions, and committees. So a little bit about who we are as an organization. I wanna also talk to you about what we do um, as an organization and how we have worked to advance DEI and county government. I really like this quote from Gear, and I'm not a person who reads uh, all the time from, from PowerPoints, but I am going to do that today because I think it's important not to only understand what diversity, equity, and inclusion is, but the purpose of this conversation is focusing on that equity from a public service perspective and where how do we do that? So advancing equity requires a systematic approach to embedding fairness and decision-making processes executive departments and agencies must recognize and work to reduce, re readdress inequities in their policies and programs that serve 
as barriers to equal opportunity. So how are we in public service improving outcomes for those who need that equitable access and opportunity in our underserved communities? In 2017, the Board of Commissioners County Administration invited community partners to participate in the Franklin County Advisory Council on Economic Inclusion. This was created to develop diverse solutions to the challenges and barriers that hinder sustainable access to equal opportunity for all Franklin County residents. The council was charged to develop a diverse set of solutions to the challenges and barriers that hinder inclusion. So that started in 2017. And in this timeline and through my presentation, I'm gonna take you through some of those examples and explain um, what happened in the years following. In 2019, the Rise Together Property Blueprint was created with county leadership, community partners, and Franklin County residents to address poverty and help reduce the way someone's race, gender, zip code, or income hinders their success. The Property Blueprint outlines 13 strategy principles under four pillars, jobs, housing, health, and youth. And what you'll see is how the Property Blueprint has been ingrained in some of our programming here at Franklin County, um, when you visit a lot of our public um, meetings, when individuals and agencies are asking for funding, um, they're going to point back to how this funding opportunity um, aligns with some of the strategic goals in our poverty blueprint. It was really important as we are addressing poverty. It wasn't the, the point wasn't to eliminate poverty. It was to address um, the barriers that poverty provides in our, our community under those four pillars. So as an organization, we were charged to think about how our service delivery, our policies and our procedures can address and align with some of those goals moving forward in our work. So we all know what happened in March of 2020, we were um, asked to go home. Um, we were now in a pandemic um, facing um, even dire strengths and strain on who were already affected by poverty. In um, May 19th, on May 19th of 2020, the Board of Commissioners passed a resolution declaring racism as a public health crisis, recognizing that race as a social construct and racism as a social system. The resolution outlines 10 goals that addresses where racism hinders equitable access and continues to be a systematic barrier. This provided that guideline in conjunction with our poverty blueprint on how we move forward with our work. Now that we are now in COVID, now that we are being exasperated by all the things that are happening um, as a result of COVID-19, where individuals don't have access to housing, um, even stronger than they didn't before, employment, um, transportation. And so we'll get into what that is. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Also in 2020, on November 17th, the Board of Commissioners passed a resolution addressing racial equity as a core principle, committing to disrupting poverty by advancing racial equity, collaborating with residents and community partners in all areas of government, committing to creating and sustaining an organizational culture and increasing contracting access to funding for minority businesses. What you see here are those four principles of that racial equity core principle. This helped govern how we were going to view our work um, moving forward. As a result of not only adding the racial equity core principle, our county administrator, um, Kenneth Wilson, decided to create and appoint um, members to be a part of a racial equity council and deemed it necessary to have a dedicated division that was going to focus on the strategies and goals of the poverty blueprint, aligning that with our declaration of declaring racism as a public health crisis and focusing on those four principles of the racial equity council. I mean, the racial equity core principle. So our office was created. Um, we, um, once I came on to, in this position of May of 2021, um, created this, this mission and some um, core principles and what you see um, before you to help ingrain um, DEI within our organization and help make policy decisions based on um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. 
This is a structure of our division, um, currently um, serving with four other colleagues, as well as um, the Racial Equity Council. Um, our county administrator appointed 29 um, individuals across our 14 county agencies. Um, and we were charged with, and I was one of those individuals, we were charged with creating um, recommendations to strategize and operationalize what does diversity, equity, inclusion look like in our internal um, organization. The inaugural Racial Equity Council um, began their term in January of 2021, and we worked with our current DEI consultant, Raising the Bar, to help create these 11 um, Racial Equity Council recommendations. Um, these Racial Equity Council recommendations um, help us to uh, really implement and provide some strategy and actionable items behind incorporating DEI internally, um, along with what was already set before us, like the poverty blueprint, our core principle and declaring racism as a public health crisis. This, this set the framework and the blueprint often say to um, the staff here for how we make decisions about the work and what we deem necessary for what will be important for our internal staff and how we serve our residents. We created a why um, that was based off of the declared racism of um, as a as a public health crisis and our racial equity core principle. Still working to dismantle systems of oppression, uh, working to create a workforce as representative of our the community that we serve, and focusing also um, on our small and emerging businesses. Understanding um, the reason behind the work that we are doing and why it's so important. In July of 2021, in partnership with our DEI consultant, Raising a Bar Performance Group, we completed the first ever culture climate audit where we survey our internal staff members um, on the four sections that you see here. It was a 73 um, questionnaire that asked them about their mindset and different ideas about how do you feel when you come to work? What is it that you need to understand that I hear our organization deeming it necessary that diversity, equity, and inclusion should be a part of that work. But as a case manager, as someone who is working um, in a facility in my position, how do I know um, what do I need to do in my booth? How do I, how does that carry for? So we receive a lot of great data um, for how we are going to carry out our racial equity um, council recommendations and what it deemed important for our internal staff. This was um, one of the times that we were able to receive some direct feedback. Um, the survey allowed for them to provide um, some handwritten responses. And it was a, a really, um, some great data that we said, here's where we need to move in and where we need to not only start from, but focus our efforts on. In strategizing and developing our diversity, equity, and inclusion division, we really work to strategize also how do we service our small and emerging businesses, our minority businesses, our women businesses, veteran-owned veteran -owned businesses, our LGBTQ plus businesses. We also took the time to look at that data to identify where were some gaps in, the, in our invoicing and funding opportunities and strategize on what, it, what we need to do. I often say that we cannot do this work alone. Um, we, I will talk to you later on about the importance of strategic partnerships. And so we included um, that collaboration as one of our economic equity goals to build that framework on how we are advancing equity in our small and emerging business enterprises here in Franklin County. Now the framework has been set. You understand that the lens that I am, I am coming from, um, from my experience in which I've shared, to, shared with you today uh, from the organization in which I am working with and have been since 2011 and really believe um, in the efforts and the, and the service that we are providing our residents here at Franklin County. I want to talk to you about equity in action and what that equity impact um, has looked like in our policy um, programs and practice here in Franklin County and some examples of that throughout um, my career. I will say um, that before being on the Racial Equity Council, uh, before 
of really, we were starting to talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, not having um, the, the, the examples and the definition or the terminology to apply the work that we were doing, I was doing in my career beforehand, and then be able to look back and say, oh, we were applying equity and, and here's how we um, were doing that. Um, so in our work today, we are always looking at social determinants of health and social determinants of health are those the conditions in which people are born in, they grow, they work in, they live in, and their age, and the wider set of forces and systems shaping the conditions of, of their daily life. So when we go back to that diversity model, that, that iceberg, uh, we're talking about that poverty blueprint, how does my, of who I am, my race, what I was born in, in a zip code, this community affect these social determinants of health and how my success will be in my access and opportunity and well-being of life. So when we look at racism as a um, definitely a health crisis, we look at how um, racism is the core of what affects our poverty and our and our internal systems, then that ultimately affects how we then have access and opportunity. Um, through our social determinant, determinants of health, how um, my what my economic stability will be, how how do I have access and opportunity um, to education? So these are really the areas that help govern some of our our programs and make decisions in that way. So some key terms or tips. So if you walk away with this and trying to understand. Diversity, equity, and inclusion seem so large. I mean, we talk a lot in our division about wow, this work is so necessary, it's so impactful, it's so needed. And I also always talk to um, the team about let's funnel that. How can we focus our efforts and where should we focus our efforts? There is a lot that is happening in our society, a lot that is happening that affects the work that we are doing. But how can we? make a greater impact by um, utilizing some of the data that we have that are affecting the folks around me and who we serve. If you are one who wants to take a look at how equity um, is affecting um, your communities, your work, the utilization of data will be very important in that public, in that public service sector. Uh, we did that again by that audit and determining um, what some of that data was telling us from that audit. When you look at our Franklin County Poverty Blueprint, it gives you um, information on you know, unemployment rates, how our poverty was being played out in our communities. Our audit alone told us that 97% of our respondents was asking for more education and awareness as it relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Our internal staff, our community partners, are always reaching in saying, I need to learn more about what are microaggressions? How do I show up? What is implicit bias? Um, we also utilize a inclusivity calendar that will let us know um, what are some important dates throughout the month that we can take, take that time to celebrate the differences in our community. So we offer ongoing racial equity training as well as monthly webinars to recognize the rich diversity in our communities. And those, those offerings are all to our board of commissioner staff and all of our community um, partners. Um, the, the back to that culture climate audit and that, and that data, telling us that where we are as an organization, letting us know that there is still some work um, that needs to be done. That we are continually talking about um, making inclusive environments. What does that look like? Our current um, leadership team is currently going through and participating in leadership circles designed to address bias, equip leaders with tools to become an anti-racist, multicultural organization, and build equity plans um, for each of their board of commissioner agencies. We use data, like I've mentioned, to measure the participation of our small and emerging businesses here in Franklin County within our agencies and identify gaps and opportunities for funding to small and emerging business. We are strategic about our partnerships, um, util utilizing the data to understand where does access and opportunity need to lie? How do we carry out this work? Um, and not only just being that voice, but 
bringing on other partners to come and help us train and educate on some key diversity, equity, and inclusion so, um, um, models. So right now we are partnering with like the YWCA who is coming to teach about belonging and inclusion. Um, we do strategic partnerships with um, a lot of our community partners that's going to help um, build that access and opportunity to women and girls in tech. Um, we focus on our African-American male wellness agency who is doing the work at, at helping um, bridge the gap and reduce health outcomes and have better health outcomes for our African-American males um, in Franklin County. Each of our board of commissioner agencies this year was charged to create um, uh, equity performance measures. We track back and if you, um, what we have often used in county government and in leadership is uh, our SMART goals. We added inclusive and equitable to creating some of those goals. So we call them SMARTY goals. Um, this was introduced by our DEI consultant and really helping organizations to understand why we wanna have great measurable outcomes. How do we incorporate inclusivity and equity a part of those goals. So here are some of those um, Board of Commissioner equity performance measures shown here that uh, some of our agencies are carrying out that work in equity and practice um, in 2023. Sustainability um, is one of, I probably say it every single day, um, is one thing to say, hey, we have we are a great funder, we are a great partner, here's where disparity lie, here's that funding. We um, are a, a really a great county at being um, a partner that is a part of a, a collaborative effort. We are there, we are helping um, out, we are being sure that we have those strategic partnerships. But how do we build sustainability when we talk talk about equity. So I talked about, you know, we want to leave this place and say, what are some key tips? Utilizing your data, figuring out where you um, have to move the needle, who was not being served in your organization and your community and the work that you were doing. Once you do that and you are able to do some things and put those things into practice and in conjunction with practicing, how do you build sustainability? So how do we know that once we leave our um our positions and move on, how are we still creating this environment where folks know that equity is important in all that we do? Um, we recently went through an employee handbook audit that gave us some recommendations on how um, to have more inclusive language. So we're changing some of our language to add protections for natural hair, acceptance of transgender status, and address invisible disabilities such mental or learning um, disabilities. We advocate through our um, government affairs division on legislature that is not only affecting DEI practices, but also affecting some of our programs here. We are working on building our inclusive, inclusivity statements and I talked about our agencies creating equity plans. Um, policy has been a part of how we build uh, and, and guide the work of public service. It's been a, a definitely a part of the, the work that I've done, not only here in Franklin County, but how we um, do direct service delivery. Sometimes we can see policy as a barrier. Um, policy provides a guide and a framework to saying, this is here where we start. Um, a lot of times, and then what can we do if those policies are creating some systematic barriers to create some of those smart egos to help build sustainability um, in, in those policies and in, in, that, in our programming. Another key um, attribute of creating equity in your public service is that continuous accessibility and belonging. So while we go back to that policy and we have some sustainable efforts through our poverty blueprint by declaring racism as a public health crisis, building a framework for what a DEI division um, looks like, changing our employee handbook, th those are the starting points. Um, we're putting, moving on to those starting points by putting some things into practice by, you know, offering those trainings, making sure that we are using the shared language, celebrating the differences of others and practicing how we show up. But how do we keep this going? How do we continually have that 
feeling as if we have that accessibility and belonging. It's one thing to read a policy. It's another thing to see that policy in action and honored and valued into what it looks like. We do that by uh, work, our workforce inclusion. Um, our Building Futures um, program was created to equip members of underserved communities with life skills and teaches them basic construction skills in order to prepare them for building trades and apprenticeship. Another example is our County Futures Program, where we're working to build a dynamic workforce representative of the community we serve. Um, the DEI leads the continued implementation of County Futures designed to recruit talent from underrepresented groups, focusing on their skills, talents, and abilities, and offering barrier moving services like um, retaining housing, um, be being able to retain your housing so you can retain your employment. So we are going out to our communities, having once a month um, hiring events, talking to individuals about their skills, talents, and abilities. We're not sitting there saying, where's your resume? We're asking about your life experiences and talking to you how, talking to individuals on how that can apply um, for a job and how they would um, best fit for, for that employment, but also offering some wraparound services to be able to retain um, employment so folks are able to come to work um, and feel safe and comfortable and be able to show up without having um, the barriers that sometimes the social determinants of health will give. Some other examples are through our health and human services agencies, and we're talking about our programs, our health and human services agencies develop and adjust programs to provide service delivery through a human-centric approach to ensure outcomes of programming address the social determinants of health, such as housing and transportation. Some of those examples are through like our family stabilization unit uh, who works with black youth ages five to 18 who are involved with the justice system, typically dealing with lower level offenses like truancy or minor delinquency or our child support enforcement who is working on fatherhood awareness um, initiatives and working to break down systematic barriers within our child support policy. Our aging um, department focuses on multi-generational home and really serving that home in a holistic um, way um, and not just with the older adult or our youth of incarcerated um, parents program offering equitable solutions for justice involved residents and their families. Um, this year in 2023, our Franklin County um, Cooperative Health Program added reprodu reproductive health benefits that are being offered through Franklin County, um, our insurance program, like our family forming um, benefits. Um, throughout you know, my career, even as a case manager um, at Job and Family Services and working to do direct service delivery, um, and when I was determining eligibility for um, child care, and, you know, we a lot of times are um, governed by what the state will tell us to do. And I think um, being able to sit down and say, here are some of the barriers in kind of our service delivery as a supervisor and administrator over those programs. We were constantly doing change management activities to recognize we are not being accessible in order to not only increase our timeliness of our application, but also on how we are serving our residents um, every day. So changing the way that we um, construct our units, um, how we talk to our community partners, like our child care providers, teaching them about child care policy, and really being that liaison and focusing on that equitable access on um, how people will gain those um, supports through, through child care. I really love this quote again from Gare that talks about advancing equity is not a one-year project. Um, it's a generational commitment that will require sustained leadership and partnership with all communities. So I hope as you are going out and working in your public service sectors that you will be able to take some um, of these examples and tips to apply equity in the work that you're doing and really focusing on how do you serve your underserved by collaborating with that community, understanding their needs, and being able to identify strategic partners that will help you move the needle in improving the outcomes for the residents and the people that you are serving around you. So Mackenzie, I thank you for this time. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer those questions.
Thank you so much, Tamika. Such a great presentation, such an important topic for all of our public servants on the call and students that will be entering the workforce. Um, I see Haven has already dropped one question in the chat asking, you know, have you experienced any pushback in establishing these DE&I initiatives? Yes, we have. I mean, we have, um, we saw those uh, challenges as opportunities um, when, you know, first coming on when, and I've especially in this organization have been here since um, 2011. And so coming into this position, I was like, oh, in various different leadership positions. And I'm thinking, oh, yeah, I have these great relationships. I've built um, great bonds. I understand um, the fabric of our organization. But showing up as Damika, the assistant director of aging or the administrative officer of child care, and now as the chief economic equity and inclusion officer, there's a different conversation and feel that has to happen. So me as a leader really had to understand that and take a step back and figuring out my approach. So we often would use um, language as, you know, coming as a partner, you know, this is a journey for all of us. This is something that has never existed in our internal system outside of the pressures of what's happening to in our society. So there's a lot of education and awareness that happens before implementation of anything. And I, and I think with anything is in regardless of where you are in your leadership um, career, um, and I'm not saying leadership as in title, I'm saying leadership as in serving. Um, you are going to have challenges. Um, so yes, there was some challenges in um, not only in putting some of these initiatives, but we have been strategically walking those out slowly. Um, we make ourselves accessible for um, conversation, phone calls, emails, and they do call. Um, and we have good, honest conversations um, and not being afraid to do, do so, but also recognizing with anything that brings challenges, not everyone is ready. And so the train is going to keep moving. You will get on board um, or you won't. Thanks. Folks, any other questions for Brittany? Keep dropping in the chat or you can just use the raise your hand feature or unmute yourself. So, so Tamika, when I, I think about Franklin County, you all are, in my view, sort of at the forefront of um, these issues and really, I think, um, bravely and appropriately did things like label racism a health crisis. Um, obviously, there are communities, particularly here in Appalachia, uh, but in other parts of the state and in, in the country as well, that that don't have that sort of administrative capacity, don't have that administrative foresight. Um, you, you gave some tips, but if, if you were working and you have worked in your career in, in some more rural places, smaller places, like mm -hmm. where would you encourage them to start to think about what we can do to support um, diversity and equity and inclusion and, and to recognize that um, there are a variety of reasons which uh, we would want to, to do that. And even if someone doesn't uh, identify as uh, a minoritized population, uh, they would still have tremendous benefit by recognizing some of these challenges and trying to be a more inclusive place. Yeah, I think uh, one of the keys, Jason, is one of the first things I even did, even coming to this position, was really identifying um, stakeholders. Who is this work important to and who we might probably have challenges with? Um, and being able to not only find the little supportive cheerleaders to help you carry on that, that torch and that message. I mean, we um, and it definitely in the beginning, really talk to people about what we were doing and why. Um, so that message was carrying out the way that we wanted it to carry out. Um, and then also not being afraid to have the conversation of, of you know, focusing on that, that hard data. So it was nothing that, you know, I am personally coming with. Here's the facts of what's happening in our community. Here are the people who are being affected by different factors, whether that was in our new American community, whether that was in other marginal, marginalized groups. Um, numbers don't lie. Um, the data doesn't lie. I think that's why data was so important, especially when you're trying to bring on um, community partners or 
bring people along who may not see the value of focusing work uh, on, on this place. And we also spent time with identifying some data with different, what different agencies um, were doing to say, kind of here's kind of where you're standing. Here's kind of where um, we can partner to help you progress um, some things along and focusing on some of the facts of the of, of that that situation, um, whether that is was with um, an internal organization or connecting them to another resource to help move those um, move those factors uh, along. Um, we are definitely, like you said, Jason, um, being able to be on the forefront. I have learned um, that you know we we talk about the challenges and struggles, but I also work with a lot of national colleagues. Um, and participating in some networks where there's still struggle um, in this area of, of getting that commitment, um, getting that leadership support and, and that, that sustainability of, of the effort. So if I could add another tip to the things that I have was really is also finding those cheerleaders and the people who are going to support that work to help you carry on that message, to help you gather the data, to help you build the resources um, and that strategic partnership because the support here from you know, our leaders, um, Administrator Wilson, our commissioners and being able to carry that message down um, does, it, does make it seemly possible uh, where in other areas I have seen the challenges to even commit to say that this is necessary. Thank you, Damika. Other questions from anyone? I could ask Damika questions all day, but I don't want to hijack the, the Q&A. So uh, let me let me ask you then another another question to me. Because so um, when you, you graduated from our MPA program, mm -hmm. and the uh, the language around the the competency has changed a little bit. But I think when you came through, one of the competencies that we tried to teach was um, helping uh, graduates of our program demonstrate competence with engaging with a diverse and changing citizenry. I think was what the the, the term was. Um, what tips and strategies sort of would you have uh, for our students who are on the call? Um, you know, they're, they're, they're coming uh, through many of them, uh, same courses, same instructors you came mm -hmm. through. I think most of what we have on the call are our on-campus students, but um, what, what tips and strategies might you give them for how they can embrace uh, with, 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 I think, real commitment to change some of the efforts that you've talked about today and try to engage with a, a more diverse and changing citizenry as the demographics of our countries change and our communities change and how can how can they do that what tips would you give them as future public administrators sure uh, i think the first thing i would say is seek first to understand i think back earlier on my career as a case manager and um, doing direct service delivery work um, and coming through, you know, my lens of, you know, Youngstown, Ohio, and, you know, being a, coming from my undergraduate degree, um, not only seeking first to understand, but also through the lens of what you're working from, um, identifying with how you are showing up through your um, implicit bias. Although, you know, I would think that I've had many lived experiences um, back then, when I think back earlier on my career, it really was truly, how am I helping to gain a relationship with the community that I'm serving? And not about what's important to me, but what's important to them. And if I wasn't competent in the areas of what was important to that community or that individual, then I'm going to learn, I'm going to help build that relationship to be able to ask the questions that I need, that's going to help that individual or that community um, succeed and what the definition of their success is and not mine. Um, so I think you constantly have to be on um, the aware of who you are and how you show up in your work, um, aware of being, wanting to always be that forever learner of, of people and being competent of what our differences are and that under that iceberg in which I, you know, I showed earlier, and then what does that look like in that service to, um, you know, that individual? People have always been the, the core and the heart of anything that I have done. 
um, not just direct service delivery in the public, but as I've also led from whichever position that I was in. Um, you know, it was, you know, understanding what your core values are. Um, you know, some of my core values are my character and, and how I want to leave um, individuals uh, when I'm leaving that room, how I want to show up honestly and, and be honest with people and speak truth and, and truth and love and light. Um, so really understanding kind of who you are and how that changes and evolves. Um, but really, truly seeking first to understand understanding your own biases and understanding who you're serving, how you can best serve them for what's going to help in their success. Thank you. So Mackenzie, I know you have some announcements, but before I kick it back over to you, any other questions or comments from anyone here for Damika or otherwise? Well, Damika, thank you so much for your time today. It's uh, Great to see uh, so many of our, our students and friends of the school, faculty. Uh, Kenneth, I know you're really busy, so it's always great to see you as, as well. Appreciate you being here, uh, support this effort. Uh, I yeah. see you unmuted, so Kenneth, I'll let you just say hello. Oh, I just want to say hello, uh, Jason, to you and, and all of the students uh, of the university. Um, as you know, uh, Jason, I am a, um, a big fan of all the work uh, that's done uh, there every day in the MPA program and in my capacity uh, here in, in Franklin County, uh, we uh, seek to help out as much as we can and, and share some of the practical real world experiences we see as uh, public administrators. So thank you. We, you're welcome, Kenneth. We appreciate you being here. For folks who don't know, uh, Kenneth's a graduate of our MPA program and was a student of Dean Weinberg's. And um, Demika's a graduate of our MPA program. I guess you were a student of Dean Weinberg's as well, one of my students. Um, I, I don't want to say that means any of us are getting old. Maybe we're just uh, <laughs> timeless and experienced, I, I guess would be maybe a good good way to put it. But it's, uh, it is always great to see these sort of... Uh, uh, multiple classes and sort of generations of, of our program continue to advance, so. Yeah, I'm one of the more antique MPA graduates. <laughs> <laughs> the executive <laughs> program didn't exist back in my day, uh, <laughs> to put it in the context. Mm. But no, it's a, you know all, the growth has been uh, tremendous. Um, I've, I've watched the mission of the Voinovich School and the, and the focus on leadership and the, the pivot to uh, emphasis on public service um, and, and keeping that connection to the state capital in, in Franklin County uh, is, I think, something that's very valuable. So um, thank you for your time. As you all saw, uh, recent graduates, per se, like uh, uh, Director uh, Chief uh, Weathers shows that uh, the school is producing leaders for tomorrow as well uh, yeah. that will prosper and contribute to uh, the state and the nation. Thank you. And uh, Kenneth and Tamika, we're, we're always looking for more students, as, as you know, for our executive program. So, mm -hmm. you know, folks in Franklin County uh, interested, please have them reach out to, to me and be happy to chat with them about our executive and, and Kenneth's right, we do have that option now for folks to go while they're still working full time. So, uh, well, thanks to everyone. Mackenzie, I know you have a litany of announcements, uh, so I don't want to uh, cut into your time and let us get out of here. So I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much to, uh, to you, Danica. Thanks for everyone for being with us uh, today. And Mackenzie, I'll, I'll finally turn it back over to you. Thanks, Jason, and thanks so much as well, Ken. Um, you know, Tamika, everyone's blowing up in the chat. You know, wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I, you know, from the bottom of our hearts, thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule. Thank you for your advocacy, your service, and your leadership, and um, helping you know our our future MPA alums um, in their public service um, journey as well. So thanks for sharing your experiences. Before you all go, um, do you want to remind you the semester is winding up. Hard to believe that we are you know, heading into April. Um, our last session will be on April 21st. Um, we'll be hearing from Mark Lubel. 
He is the professor and director of the Center for Environmental Policy and Behavior at UC Davis. Um, he'll be sharing about the pursuit of cooperation in complex um, governance systems. So looking forward to hearing that. So mark your calendars um, for that date and stay tuned for those announcements. And again, thank you all for joining and have a wonderful weekend.